This episode is brought to you by Squarespace, the all-in-one platform to build your online business. What is going on Solo fam? My name is John Solo and the beard is officially gone. For some reason, I feel inclined to say both I'm sorry and you're welcome. Not gonna lie, I did miss how it felt being silky smooth, but now I'm feeling extra self-conscious about my youthful boy face. So I guess there's no winning. What a great metaphor for life, huh? Anyway, ladies and gents, welcome to another episode of Messed Up Origins, the show where I take stories and characters we've all grown to love since we were babies and ruin them with the truth. At least some say I ruin them. Others say I make them better. My only goal is to make them more interesting. And I think I nailed that perfectly with today's topic, Pegasus, the winged horse of the gods. If you've been conscious for more than a few years, it's pretty much guaranteed that you've encountered Pegasus somewhere in your life. He's one of the most recognized figures in Greek mythology and has made appearances or been referenced in all kinds of movies, shows, books, and even on logos. Usually he fills the role of the noble steed for heroes like Hercules and Perseus, but what I find interesting is that the real mythology of Pegasus Pegasus's birth and ensuing adventures has never been shared in mainstream media, so I want to do my part to correct that. Before we dive in though, I've got to say thanks to longtime friend of the channel and today's sponsor, Squarespace. If you haven't figured it out by now, we are huge fans of Squarespace on this channel, and that's because they are amazing at what they do. If you're a creator or small business owner that needs a domain, website, or online store, you can make it with Squarespace. They've been helping people like you and I for years now. Entrepreneurs, photographers, bloggers, musicians, and we owe them a debt of gratitude for making the website creation process so easy. There's never anything to download, patch, or install into your computer or whatever device you're working on. Just open up your favorite web browser and you're good to go. From there, you can pick from one of dozens of award-winning templates they offer, each with their own unique benefits, depending on what kind of site you're looking to launch. And in 2021, the design interface is smoother and easier to use than ever. Dragging and dropping photos into a gallery or linking to other parts of your website is as simple as a few clicks of the mouse. And with that, that being said, if you want to join me and the many others in the solo fam who've joined Squarespace only to find out it's as amazing as advertised, go to squarespace.com slash John Solo and sign up for your free trial. Then when you're ready for your website's grand opening, use code John Solo to get 10% off your first purchase. I've got to say, as far as ad reads go, that one was up here. I don't have to tell you that though, because you watched the whole thing, right? 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 Anyway, on that note, it is time to just jump into it, as Philly D would say, so let's do just that. As always, make sure you hit those like and subscribe buttons if you want to see more content like this in your sub box and recommended feed. And now, the messed up origins of Pegasus. Depending on which version of Pegasus you've been exposed to the most, you could have a variety of different ideas about what he is, whom he served, and the kind of adventures he went on. You may know him as a creation of Zeus, made special for his son Hercules out of a little Cirrus, a touch of Nimbostratus, and a dash of Cumulus. They were best friends from the very start, and Pegasus was a noble companion throughout their adventures, though I've got to call him out for being a massive hypocrite and getting irritated at Hercules' crush on Meg when he got distracted by the first pair of big goo-goo eyes that looked at him. He also shows up in 2010's Clash of the Titans, where Princess Io claims he'd never been ridden by another human until the hero Perseus took his proverbial reins. And who could forget Barbie in The Magic of Pegasus, where the flying horse was actually a princess before being transformed by an evil wizard. I'll give you three guesses which one is the least accurate, and the first two don't count. No, I'll be honest, not a single one of those is all that close to the original mythos. I mean, some are more accurate than others, with grains of truth buried deep inside their artistic interpretation but the real Pegasus had very different origins and a master that a lot of you probably haven't heard of. So let's start at the beginning. For what may be the first time in the history of this series, all of the ancient Greek poets we're citing agree about his parentage, with the infamous Gorgon Medusa being his mother and the god of the sea Poseidon being his father. Now for those who aren't familiar, Poseidon and Medusa did not have a healthy relationship. Before she was transformed into a Gorgon, Medusa was actually a beautiful mortal who swore herself to celibacy and became a priestess at the goddess Athena's temple. But one day, when Poseidon saw her walking along the beach, he decided that he had to have her. And while she rejected his advances every time, gods don't often take no for an answer. He pursued her into Athena's temple, where she thought she was going to be protected by her patron goddess, and forced himself on her. This enraged Athena, but not in the way that you would think. She was furious that Medusa would dare break her sacred vow of celibacy, and punished her by transforming her into a gorgon. Her hair was transfigured into a nest of snakes, and 
her face became so hideous that anyone who looked at it would turn to stone. If you're interested in hearing more about Medusa, I'd recommend you check out the video I made where I cover her complete story and every variation of it, but for now, that's all you need to know. Because according to some ancient writers, it was this event that led to Medusa getting pregnant with Pegasus, but others claim it actually happened after. In this other version, Poseidon wasn't completely turned off by her new look and wanted to hook up again, which kind of defeats the purpose of Athena's curse, right? Only because he knew she would be on the defensive if he showed up as himself, he came in the form of either a horse or a bird and seduced her, which is a very weird mental image. Picture it, Solo fam. Picture Poseidon impregnating Medusa while disguised as a horse because I felt a little too uncomfortable to commission an artist to draw it. But here's where we fast forward to Medusa's death and Pegasus's birth, as the two happen almost simultaneously. After the hero Perseus hunts the Gorgon down and chops off her head, Pegasus is said to have sprung from the bloody stump of her neck, along with his fully human brother, Creasor, who sounds like he should be a Pokemon. I've gotta say, that's one of the more f***ed up births we've talked about in this series so far, although it probably would have been worse for Medusa if she pushed him out the traditional way. Oh, and check this out, that story may actually be how Pegasus got his name, which can be roughly translated to spring forth, as in spring forth out of Medusa's neck. It's either that or of the spring, which could be a reference to the spring of Oceanos where he was born. There's another version of the myth where instead of coming out of her neck, both he and his brother are born from her blood that spills into the spring. So really, both explanations make sense. It's also worth noting that in the texts, Pegasus is described as being pure white and not black like he appears in Clash of the Titans. Titans, and the poet Hesiod never actually described him as having wings, though later writers like Pindar and Euripides specifically mention them. With that being said, we are just getting started with the life of Pegasus, so let's talk about what happened after his birth and which of the Greek heroes he really called his master. So I'm not sure why, but for some reason, I always pictured Perseus jumping on Pegasus's back right after he killed Medusa and triumphantly flying all over Greece and going on adventures with Medusa's head. Maybe that's because that's how it goes down in Clash of the Titans with Pegasus showing up right after Perseus escapes, but it turns out I've been wrong this entire time. Pegasus actually went off and lived the life of a wild stallion for a while, flying wherever he wanted, peeing wherever he wanted. It was the dream. But that all changed when his father Poseidon sent him to help a guy named Bellerophon with an important mission. So let me explain. Bellerophon was born in Corinth and was the son of the mortal Eurynome by either her husband Glaucus or Poseidon. While Bellerophon ends up being exiled from his own kingdom for the murder of his brother and subjects himself to a king named Proetus who absolves him of his crimes and allows him to stay in his palace for a while. You see, the ancient Greeks had this social custom known as Xenia, which was basically a sacred rule of hospitality. Whenever a guest humbly presented themselves to a host, Host, that host was obligated to fulfill all of the guests' needs that they could. That meant feeding them, entertaining them, and say if the guest was someone of status like King Odysseus, then they may even offer their own daughter's hand in marriage or safe passage home. So that's why Bellerophon was able to stay in the king's palace. Only things went south when the esteemed guest had to reject the queen after she made a pass at him. She had a very fragile ego, so she told the king he attempted to force himself on her. But because Bellerophon was protected by the Xenian custom, the King Proetus had to send him to King Iabates, his father-in-law, for punishment. He gave Bellerophon a sealed note to pass on to the king that said, pray remove the bearer from this world. He attempted to violate my wife, your daughter. Only here's the problem. Bellerophon and Iabates partied together for nine days straight before the king opened the note. So at that point, Bellerophon was once again protected by Xenia. Not wanting to risk the wrath of the Orinyes if he were to murder a guest, he sent Bellerophon on a few missions that he deemed impossible similar to what King Eurystheus did to Heracles with the Twelve Labors. And this is where Pegasus finally comes in. Bellerophon's first task was to kill the Chimera that was terrorizing the countryside of a nearby kingdom. And for those who don't know, Chimeras are scary as hell. Born from the union of Typhon and Echidna, thus making it a sibling of Cerberus and the Lernaean Hydra, the Chimera was a fire-breathing beast with the head and body of a lion, a goat's head on its back, and a snake head on its tail. Bellerophon knew he'd never survive the encounter if he was on his own, so he tried to capture the wild Pegasus several times before consulting with a famous seer who told him to spend a night in the temple of Athena. He did just that, and while he was sleeping, Athena came to him and said that to catch the winged horse, he'd have to make a sacrifice to Poseidon 
Then when he woke up, he found a golden bridle next to him, sacrificed it, and what happens next depends on your source. Athena might tame Pegasus herself, which kind of defeats the purpose of the sacrifice. Bellerophon could successfully catch Pegasus while he's drinking at a well, or Poseidon, who in this version is Bellerophon's father, could bring Pegasus to him personally. You can pick whichever is your favorite. All you need to know is that immediately after taming Pegasus, our hero flew him right to the Chimera. Hovering just out of its reach, he pelted the monstrosity with arrow after arrow until it was weak. Then he shoved his spear right down its fire-breathing gullet. After this, King Iobates sent Bellerophon on two more suicide missions to take out a tribe of barbarians and the Amazons. But much to his chagrin, our hero succeeded. And the part I find hilarious is that after Iobates has exhausted all of his other options, he just commands his guards to ambush and kill Bellerophon, but even then, he slaughters them all. After this, the king had no choice but to accept that he was the son of a god and welcomed him into his house as his son-in-law and heir. Talk about a change of heart. Only the story isn't over yet, because Bellerophon still wasn't happy with his accolades and elevated status. No, he wanted to join the gods in Olympus, which is not something that mortals should ever ask for, so he didn't. Instead of asking, he just got on Pegasus's back, and the two of them flew towards the heavens. Little did they know that Zeus was watching them the entire time and did not appreciate his nephew's sense of entitlement. So you want to know what he did? The king of the gods summoned a gadfly to bite Pegasus, which made him buck and throw Bellerophon off his back, sending him falling hard and fast back down to earth. And believe it or not, he doesn't always die from the fall. There's one telling where he survives, but having rejected the world of men and being rejected by the gods, he's left to wander the earth alone and miserable. Meanwhile, Pegasus really didn't care too much about losing his master, and in some versions, his half-brother. So he continued on to Olympus, where either Eos, the goddess of dawn, or Zeus welcomed him with open arms. From that point onward, the noble steed held a permanent home in Zeus's palace, where he was given the responsibility of carrying around his thunderbolts. Not gonna lie though, that seems like a waste of talent for something as incredible as a flying horse. At least he made a constellation for him though. That was actually pretty nice. Now this last section is a bit of an odd one, because if you go back and read the ancient texts, there's only really one story where Pegasus has anything to do with the Muses, but apparently in modern times, they're associated together quite a lot. Maybe it's because they're both beautiful creatures with their roots in nature, but that's a total guess. Now for those curious about the one myth I mentioned, it involves a singing contest between the nine daughters of King Pyrrhus, known as the Pyrrhides, and the Muses, the inspirational goddesses of literature, science, and the arts. It's actually kind of funny. So apparently when the king's daughters sang, all became darkness, which I'll admit is a vague description, but can't be a good sign. Meanwhile, when the muses sang, the heavens, the sea, and the rivers all stood still to listen. Then Mount Helicon, filled with delight at the sound of their beautiful voices, rose upward and kept rising upward until Poseidon told Pegasus to kick it. And this led to the creation of Hippocrene, the inspiring well of the muses, which could be found on Mount Helicon. Well, either that's how the well got there or Pegasus made it because he was thirsty, which also gives an explanation for similar wells that could be found all over Greece. Now, one thing I do want to make clear is that while Pegasus is the only winged horse that has a name and specific parentage, there are others scattered here and there throughout the Greek mythos. In art specifically, we see winged horses referred to as Pegasi depicted as pulling chariots of some of the gods, like Helios and Selene. There's also a few Greek legends that mention them in passing, and I did find out they were believed to originate from Ethiopia. Makes you wonder what the thought process process was behind giving Pegasus a name and a completely different country of origin. It's stuff like that that makes me wonder if any of this has roots in reality. But that solo fam was the messed up origins and complete mythology behind Pegasus. If you don't know, now you know. Oh, I almost forgot about his brother Creasor. I'm sure at least a few of you were wondering what that guy's about and why his name sounds like some off-brand wart remover? Well, that name can actually be translated to he who has a golden sword. And while there isn't much in the way of myths about him, we do know that he ended up marrying a woman whose name I can't pronounce, and together they spawn the giant Garion and half-woman, half-snake, Echidna. One day, Solo fam, one day I'm gonna make a family tree for the Greek pantheon, and it's going to be glorious and also a complete pain in the ass. In the meantime, my mission for today is finally complete, so I'm gonna wrap this up. If you haven't already, I would really love it if you hit those like and subscribe buttons. They're a great way to support the channel and get more content like this in your sub box and recommended feed. For those who wanna stay updated on Messed Up Origins news, like when new videos are coming out and hints about what they'll be about, 
follow me on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. And while I may not have a flying horse for you to follow, I do have a lumpy little doggo. So give his Instagram a gander, why don't ya? I'll see you all again next week when I unpack even more mythological goodness. Until then, my name is John Solo, and remember, John shot first. Thank you.